Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, let me first apologise. We're having a couple of technical difficulties getting in our um, uh, chair for today's event, which is um, Professor Jane Downs. We're hoping she'll be able to join us shortly. Um, first of all, I'd just like to remind everybody that today's session is being recorded. Uh, so if there's any reason that you do not want to have uh, any details shared, please leave the event and then either come back in using um, uh, a blank name um, or, or if you prefer to leave the event completely. Can I remind you that we'll be taking Q&A and so if you have any questions for Professor Ingrid Maidlin, please place those into the Q&A function, which you'll find at the bottom of your screen, either three dots or, or possibly labelled as more options. So without further ado, I'd like to pass over to one of our other professors, Professor Andrew Ray, who's a professor of engineering based at Perth College UHI, and he will introduce um, our professor giving her inaugural lecture today, uh, Ingrid Mainland. Just over to you, uh, thanks, Andrew. Thank you, Jill. Uh, good afternoon and welcome everybody to this inaugural lecture from Professor Ingrid Mainland. Um, it's a, it's a personal uh, privilege and joy to, to welcome her to the professoriate. Um, Professor Mainland has been awarded her personal chair in recognition of her research achievements establishing archaeological science as part of the Archaeology Institute's curriculum and spearheading the growth of its master's programs. Professor Ingrid Mainland is an internationally recognized archaeological scientist with 30 years experience as an academic researcher, lecturer and leader in her field. Based in Orkney, her research interests and expertise lie in zoo archaeology and the archaeology of food, fodder and consumption. Originally from the Orkney island of Rossi, uh, Professor Mainland has le left to attend university, graduating from the University of Durham with a BA honours in archaeology in 1987. She was awarded a PhD from the University of Sheffield in 1995. After lecturing at the Universities of Sheffield and Bradford, she joined the University of the Highlands and Islands in 2009 where she led the development and introduction of its undergraduate and postgraduate archaeology courses, leading to a steady growth in student numbers, presently around 100 undergraduates and 50 postgraduates. Since joining the university, Professor Mainland has attracted significant research funding and published numerous academic papers. Recent awards include the Arts and Humanities Research Council and the German Research Council funded Looking In From The Edge project, a three year collaboration between the Universities of Highlands and Islands, the Universities of Vienna, Lincoln and the German Maritime Museum, exploring the impact of international commercialization on Northwest Europe's peripheral communities from 1468 to 1712. In 2012, she was appointed curriculum leader for archaeology and went on to develop a learning environment in which students can engage in practical aspects of the archaeology and gain transferable skills via distance learning. The virtual labs package, for example, enabled development of the BSc in archaeological science, a degree in which a high volume of hands on laboratory experience is normally seen as essential. The virtual field trip and field manual have also seen the expansion of the distance delivery MLIT archaeology studies program. During the COVID-19 crisis, these allowed the Institute to respond very quickly to the limitations placed on face to face teaching. And as a result, student numbers in archaeology at the university continue to be very robust with a record intake of master's students. In 2015, she was awarded a prestigious British Academy mid-career fellowship for research into the sustainability of farming and food production in Viking and Lake North Scotland. She is currently collaborating on several international research projects, working with colleagues in the USA, Iceland, Canada, Norway, France and Cyprus on different aspects of medieval farming and food strategies in the North Atlantic Islands and on sheep and goat husbandry in the Mediterranean Islands. In Orkney, her research has focused on the fauna from the Nessa Brodka, an important Neolithic site in Rassi, where working with the Island Development Trust and the local community, she is one of the directors of ex excavations at the Viking to post medieval hall and farmstead at scale. An active researcher, Professor Maimond has been invited to present papers at international events from Norway to the USA and remains a staunch advocate for community outreach and public engagement. I now hand over to Professor Mainland for her lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Andrew, for that introduction. And, and indeed, thank you all for coming um, today to listen to my inaugural lecture. Um, I'm just going to take a minute now to load up my slide. Um, which will just take a, a second and then and then we will begin. Okay.
Okay, so moving on. Um, so um, the format that I've chosen today is um, to provide an overview of one aspect of my research, which is the archaeology of food and fodder. Um, in other words, the, the trough and trencher of the title. Um, what I'm going to be trying to do in the course of this, um, this lecture is um, explore some of the contributions that my research has made to this, this theme or this area, um, as well as reflecting on um, future directions. And this just gives you an, an overview of some of the topics that I'm, I'm going to be um, um, providing you an overview of today. Um, I wanted, first of all, to start a little bit and say a few words, however, about archaeological science, because I, I know that um, the audience that, that we have today is, is, is quite broad, and, and I suspect that there may be people here who are not as familiar with what archaeology is in terms or what archaeological science is within archaeology. So I thought I'd, I'd start with a, a sort of introduction to archaeological science um, and archaeological science at the UHI before moving on to um, talk more specifically about my own research. Um, Archaeological science is, quite simply, the development and application of scientific techniques within archaeology. Um, it covers a range of different areas of expertise, um, and, and I, I would say it, it does place a strong emphasis on methodological development and, and application. Um, it's a growth area within archaeology, and there is a demand for um, people with archaeological science expertise, um, and there are you know, there are demands for um, employment within within the sector. Um, because of that, we are very keen to establish an archaeological site, or I was very keen to establish an archaeological science strand within um, the UHI, um, within the programmes that we offer. Um, and to this end, we, we have two degree programmes now, um, two BSCs. Um, we also have ensured that we've got key and transferable skills in science within our, within our BA um, programmes, and in fact, they're available to other humanities degrees as well. Uh, we have other pathways, specialist archaeological science options within within our master's programmes as well. Um, and we've also started to grow research capacity within the area of archaeological science as well. In fact, as, as Andrew was mentioning in introduction to me. Um, we have a particular skill set within the area of environmental archaeology and paleo dietary studies in terms of researchers, and this is also the area within which um, I have my own specialism. And we have around we have four members of staff who now have expertise within this area, um, and um, we also have an, a numerous um, amount of PhDs and, and MRS students. Um, so by embedding this strand within our programmes, within sort of encouraging the development of archaeological science at the UHI, we are addressing skill shortages in the heritage sciences and across the sector. Across the sector, but we're also providing STEM training and transferable skills um, within our humanities degrees, which is sort of meeting demands for data and science savvy humanities graduates. So we're we're thinking we're looking to expand and further develop in this area, and and I'm very pleased that my um, professorship was awarded in the area of archaeological science in recognition of the development that's gone on already, but also as a, a sort of spur for future development in this area. Um, so, kind of turn to turn more specifically to my to my own research area. As I mentioned, I'm an archaeological scientist. Um, I work within the area of zoo archaeology. Um, zoo archaeology is essentially um, a subject that deals with human animal interactions in, in the archaeological past. Um, zoo archaeologists focus on the remnants of the animals within the archaeological past, so in other words, within our soils and sediments that, that we excavate, um, and those remnants are animal bones and teeth. These, these are the remains that are preserved after, um, after organic decay has its, has its effect on, on the the material remains that are deposited in the past. Um, Zooarchaeology is concerned with remnants of food processing and consumption, as well as um, craft production and, and sometimes deliberate internment of animal bodies as well. So as a zooarchaeologist, I'm dealing with the rubbish pits, um, the midden refuse um, of past societies. Um, Although I'm talking about um, food and fodder today, my, my research is, is broader than that. Um, I have an interest in North Atlantic faunas, um, 
animal animals and animal ecosystems from um, from the North Atlantic Islands, including the Scottish Islands. Um, I have an interest in Scottish faunas. Um, I, I actually study um, faunal remains from um, all the way through from Mesolithic all the way up to to the 19th century. Um, but I have a particular interest in Viking and post medieval periods, and I'm going to be giving you some case studies from from this later on. Um, most of my research fo focuses on farming um, and past farming systems, and um, I think that reflects my ancestry and or my beginnings in Orkney, where where I came from a, a farming family, and I've kept this interest with me through through my career. Um, so to turn to um, the, the main focus of today's talk, which is an archaeology of food forgery and consumption. Um, and this is an area that I've been involved with since the very beginning of my research, as, as I will show you as I kind of take you through a history of, of the research I've undertaken in, in this area. Um, I thought to put this slide up first, just to sort of explain why archaeologists are interested in, in food and indeed fodder. Um, I think you, as I kind of weigh into this as a question, I think you only really need to sort of reflect on what you're going to have when you go home this evening for um, your tea, for your dinner, or perhaps even your supper um, as your evening meal, and to think about um, the foods that you're going to consume, where those foods were grown, um, how many miles those foods have travelled to, to get to your plate, think about where you're sitting, who's sitting with you, um, and whereabouts you sit around that table. All of all of this is um, embodied with meaning and um, and and gives you information about your identity. Um, it gives you information about um, your culinary traditions. Um, you'll have information about cooking practice and cuisine that you use. And at the back of it, of course, there's the information on the animal and and um, plant husbandry systems, the farming practices that generated. Um, the food that you're eating, or indeed you may be getting food through through trade and exchange as well through you know, exotics coming all the way from um, America, India, Africa, um, I, you know whatever whatever is on on your table this evening, may well have some elements of all of this, and and that is precisely the the, the reason that we're interested in this as archaeologists because it gives us this insight, this great insight in, into past societies. Um, because we're dealing with archaeological evidence, um, our sources are restricted. Um, the processes of decay um, affect um, what we what we recover. So, you know, imagine you're throwing material out in your in your rubbish bin or in your midden, um, if you still have one of those, um, that becomes buried and um, and deposited um, over a long period of time. Not everything will be will be preserved. Um, so these are I've just made a list here of the types of evidence that, that we we recover as archaeologists and we look at. And, and these range from direct evidence, such as animal bone and plant remains, which is um, one of the sources I study, um, through to organic residues and food food utensils, um, looking at the food utensils themselves. We could also look at building and architecture. We can, if we're dealing with historical periods, we can look at historical and ethnographic accounts. Um, and then we can also look at physical and chemical changes to bone and dental tissue. And the two that I've put in bold there are the ones that I'm that I'm particularly um, interested in researching. This is what my research is primarily focused on. Um, and they're also the ones that I'm going to talk about tonight in a little bit more detail. Um, you can draw a distinction between them in terms of indirect and direct, I've indicated there. Um, direct approaches are where you can actually get an insight into what's being consumed by the consumer itself. So in other words, um, by looking at um, the skeletal remains, you get an insight into what was consumed. Animal bone and plant, plant remains just gives you an indirect evidence because you don't know who has consumed that evidence. I'll explain this in a little bit more detail in, in some of the slides that are coming up. So um, if we go into the next slide. Um, the research that I've done um, on um, food and fodder in the past, as I mentioned earlier, goes all the way back to, to my PhD at Sheffield University. Um, at Sheffield University, I um, was interested or I developed um, 
a technique called dental microanalysis and applied it to livestock diet. Um, so, in other words, I was involved with what you might refer to as proof of concept work. And this was a PhD that was sponsored or supported, funded by CERC, which um, is now is now NERC, um, one of the science funding bodies within um, the research um, within the, the UK research environment. Um, so, uh, dental microware is um, a technique. This, if you look at your slides there, you can see um, an image of a tooth surface at very high magnification. Um, when you consume food, the abrasives in the food or the hardness of the food itself, whether you're dealing with a hard or a soft diet, um, affects tooth surfaces. Um, effect, essentially, you, you sort of lose tiny little bits of, of enamel um, as you chew if your food's very abrasive or very hard. Um, studies in a, a wide variety of, of um, mammals has shown that wear traces can be associated with particular dietary um, types. Um, so, for example, folivores versus fugivores, grazing versus browsing, and so on. Um, and this technique had been applied quite widely to extinct hominids, to ancient humans, and within um, paleontological contexts to extinct mammals. Um, I was the first to apply it within an archaeological context to livestock diets. So, as I mentioned, I did the proof of concept work during my PhD and then subsequently doing a, during a British Academy postdoctoral fellowship that I, I also had at, at um, Sheffield University. Um, so, the, the proof of concept work here was to establish whether this methodology worked to investigate domestic livestock diet. I looked at sheep and goats. I looked at sheep and goats from a wide um, range of different environments across um, the northern sort of temperate zone grasslands. I looked at sheep from Greenland, Iceland, Denmark, Scotland. I looked at different habitats within that. Um, and I also looked at some Mediterranean zone um, species as well. I also looked at um, different types of fodder. And the, the sort of um, outcome was that it emerged as a, as a, as a technique. Um, you can use it to identify different grazing habitats. You can use it to identify season and intensity of grazer at grazing, and you can also use it to identify different fodder types. Um, I'm not going to explain what the graphs and images show, but again, these, these pictures are, are different images of, of tooth surfaces in sheep. Um, in terms of application, um, I followed this up with a, a British Academy postdoctoral fellowship, as I mentioned, at Sheffield University, and I applied the technique to an archaeological context. And that to see, again, it was a kind of proof of concept. So here I applied it to grazing management in the North Atlantic Islands. And I was looking in particular at the impact of the introduction of grazing sheep, goats and other livestock, but I, I mostly looked at sheep on um, Greenland and Iceland. Now, Greenland and Iceland were settled by the Vikings and the, um, during um, the sort of period from around about 9,000 to 1,000 AD, um, established settlements there. Um, obviously, quite famously, the Greenlandic settlements ended um, in around about 1450. Um, Iceland, as we know, continued. Um, the impact of grazing herbivores on these islands has has been much um, studied and has has been much um, discussed and indeed the impact of grazing sheep on de the denudation of environment in Iceland and indeed Greenland has been suggested to go all the way back to to the first their first introduction by by the the Viking um, settlers. So this was the you know this is why I wanted to apply this um, this technique this new technique to um, um, you know, to a, an area where you might come up with some interesting um, answers on grazing management and their impact in in the North Atlantic. So, in other words, the impact of farming on on these environments. Um, as is often the way when you undertake research, um, that you know, I, I revealed that the situation is not quite as simple as the sheep got there. They were overgrazing, and, and Greenland settlement um, ceased to exist. Um, it, it transpires that it's a much, much more complex situation where um, the timing and scale of grazing is very important. I discovered that there have been um, winter grazing in in Greenland during the Viking period and the Norse period. Sorry, um, 
and, and winter grazing is particularly impactful, but it doesn't have an impact across the whole environment if, if you restrict it around the settlements. And that, that seems to have been what happened. Um, so grazing was impact, impactful in Greenland, but it wasn't impactful. You know, it wasn't extensively impactful and probably didn't cause the, the decline of the of the, the colonization of, of Greenland. Um, in terms of um, Iceland, again, the situation was quite complex. It seems to vary by farm. Um, it probably varied by status in that um, the, the sort of more rich and wealthier farmers were able to mitigate the effects of soil erosion and, and overgrazing um, and grazing pressure, whereas the smaller farmers may, may not have been. Um, you know, so again, it's, it's a complex story. Um, but what it seemed to suggest is that, you know, you don't get automatically get introduced sheep to these islands and you have mass mass overgrazing and denudation. It's a, it's an ongoing process. Um, so my, my research here was, was able to contribute to, to some of the theories regarding um, grazing impacts at, in these islands. Um, I've subsequently asked, I've subsequently gone on to um, expand my interest in sheep and goat microware to, to other species. Um, I've looked at um, pig domestic or pig microware, used it to look at pig domestication. Um, I've also looked at, at the sort of management of pigs through this technique in, in other contexts as well, classical, medieval, some examples are, are just shown there. Um, I've also used the technique to look at early um, farming societies in southern Europe, um, in Greece, and I'm currently involved in a project with Angel Angelos Hachim Kumas in with, at the University of Cyprus um, to look at um, medieval, um, sorry, classical and Hellenistic um, microarea in in Cyprus. Um, and and again, you know, another couple of examples there of work that I've still got ongoing. I'm I'm still working in Iceland. I've recently um, been funded to work with colleagues from the University of Bergen and um, the University of Iceland again looking at sheep and goat management in in um in these islands so this is you know, ongoing work um right i'm conscious that time is passing so i'll move on to um other direct um paleo dietary techniques that that i've been used i've used or, or developed um to um to reconstruct an um livestock diet within within um archaeological context so um stable isotopes is a um is a very well established technique which has been used since the 1970s to reconstruct um, both human and animal diet. Um, it works on the principle that um, you, effectively you are what you eat, your, um, your bone chemistry will reflect um, diet particular dietary aspects of, of what you consume. So um, depending on the types of plants you consume, depending on whether you're consuming um, marine and terrestrial wood food webs, depending on um, the season of grazing, if you're dealing with animals and so on. I've, I've listed some of these factors here. Um, I, I haven't been involved in fundamental research in stable isotopes. I, I, I generally work with other people who um, research and in this area, um, but I have had a series of quite important collaborations, um, including an ERC grant um, to look into um, identifying modern baseline signatures for terrestrial and marine grazing environments in the Northern Isles. And this established, helped establish um, um, the stable isotope baselines that you would expect where you've got sheep grazing um, grass and also sheep grazing on marine seaweeds. And obviously in, in an Orcadian context, the identification of seaweed is really quite interesting and important because of our very famous North Ronaldsey sheep, which subsist um, nowadays almost entirely on, on seaweed. Um, so I've undertaken um, research that has helped map out some of the baseline um, stable isotope signatures that, that help us then interpret or identify this kind of feeding behaviour in the past. Um, and I've recently had a PhD student, Mag Magdalena Balanz, who's just completed and who is, who's been taking this, this research um, further and has, um, has, looked into, um, has looked into identifying um, seaweed consumption um, and the, the dates and the beginnings of seaweed consumption, finding evidence for, for um, seaweed consumption as far back as the Neolithic. 
um, at the site of Ness Brodger, which again, I'm going to be talking about shortly. Um, other research that I've undertaken in terms of livestock farming in the Northern Isles, and I'm sorry, but the slide there is the wrong slide. I've just suddenly realised that I've popped up the, long, the wrong image, um, which did throw me for a second there. But if you look on the left hand side of, of the slide here, the PowerPoint slide here, you'll see some of the other applications that I've been involved in, in terms of stable isotopes. And um, some of this is work of um, PhD students, so Jacqueline Taras, um, we worked together to, to identify extending birthing season in cattle within the Iron Age using isotopes, um, coming to the realisation that um, an adaptation to northern environments, um, farming in these northern environments was extending the birthing season season of cattle so that you could have milk all year round and, and have a sort of um, a ready supply of, of a nutritious um, source of, of um, food that you could use for um, drinking, but you could also use for making cheese and butter and so on. Um, I've also um, done research on using isotopes to pick up winter grazing and wintering foddering, both in the Iron Age and, and the Viking Norse period. Now, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the implications of this and in, in some of the case studies I'm about to about to present. OK, so. What I've been talking about mostly so far is methods and techniques and, and the contributions that my research has made um, to some of the direct sources of evidence that we can use to get an insight into you know what was being eaten by who and and the research that i've done as i indicated in that area is mostly to do with livestock um you know i've, I've had a long interest in in livestock diet and and the different and i've been developing methods and approaches to help me understand that um as my um as my career has progressed however i've become more and more interested in um the sort of broader implications of food um, and not just fodder, but also food, also human food um, in terms of what that can tell us about um, about past societies. And in particular, I'm interested in what I've described here as commensal events um, and what um, these commensal events, which is to some extent feasting, um, the, the coming together and eating together um, and sharing of food, often in highly prescribed ways, and, and a feast is a sort of ultimate manifestation of that. By feast, and you know, it could be a, a you know meal that you have at a party, or or it could be, um, it could be Christmas dinner, for example, or a larger gathering of, of people. So, um, I've become very interested in in what we can do with this sort of information archaeologically, and how, in fact, the coming together and eating together can change societies. Um, and when you eat, and I kind of gave a hint about this when I, in, in my introduction there, when you eat, what you eat, who you eat with, where you eat, um, you know, where you choose to sit, what you're given to eat with by somebody who's inviting you to a party, um, often confers a lot of meaning about a society. Um, so and there's some really example good examples of this historically if, if you look in medieval context for example um you find examples of um, um <clears throat> feasts held by some of the early irish kings for example where you get a very strict subdivision of the carcass of the of the the, the meat that you know the, the beast that you're eating um so that people of different rank are given um different parts of the body um you know, the piper is given a particular joint, um, the king himself gets tenderloin, perhaps quite obviously. Um, and where you're seated in these kind of events, again, from historical sources, can, can really um, tell everybody something about you. Um, and can also be a way of controlling people and, um, and by doing so, um, forcing, you know, creating possibility for, for a social change. Um, so, through um, a British Academy um, mid-career fellowship, I got the opportunity to explore um, some of these ideas within um, the context of um, Norse, again, Norse and Viking society in, um, in Orkney. Um, so, Viking Orkney is a, is a really good um, place, or the Viking society, in fact, is a really good place to, to look at the importance of, of commensality and feasting, because um, at this time, 
um, particularly in, in the sort of what we call the Viking period around about 800 to 1000 AD, the hall, the drinking hall was the focus of feasting activities and other forms of gift, gift exchange. And in fact, food and consumption and um, the ability to host a feast um, was part of the power politics of, of the day. Um, and I've just given you a little quote there from the Orkney Inga saga, which is the saga about the Earls of Orkney, which shows how some of this can work. Um, Earl, the Earl is inviting people to a great feast where he presented his friends with gifts um, and all of them then promised him their undying friendship. There's a kind of indication of re reciprocal activity there. If you give a feast, you have to give something back in return. That could be another feast, or that could be um, that could be your your loyalty, which is what that quote is, is indicating. So, within um, the Northern Isles, I was I was interested in exploring how how this was working, how this was manifest. Um, I was interested in seeing what different types of food the Norse earls of Orkney um, might be using, um, and and I should kind of give you a sort of date here the this i'm looking at the period from around about 800 ad up until um around about um 1450 ad so we're dealing with early medieval society in, in the northern isles and of course orkney and shetland were part of that same um movement of of people from scandinavia that that eventually um colonized greenland and iceland as well so it's you know, it's part of my broad interest in this area um so i was looking um at trying to find evidence of um different types of consumption. I was trying to see if we could pick up evidence of commensal behaviour, evidence of feasting. I was looking to see what kind of foods might be used by the Earls to show status. Um, and I used an, a, a variety of different approaches to do that. I looked at zooarchological evidence, the animal bones in the middens, um, looked at what age of death these animals were when they were killed. I looked at um, which species, obviously. I looked at the different elements that were represented. Um, and I also looked at the underpinning farming systems as well. So I was interested in knowing what kind of livestock husbandry might generate the food debris that um, the Viking earls and the Norse earls were consuming at, at their residences. Um, and really to cut a long story short, because I could talk about this for, for the whole talk, and um, I'm, I'm trying to stop myself from doing that. I'll just give you some, some of the key findings. Um, so. The one thing is that pig emerges as a species that the, the Norse Earls in, in Orkney really like to consume, and in fact, they're chieftains. Um, so they're, they're sort of um, their right hand men, as it were. Um, there is some evidence for um, redistribution in the Viking period in sheep and cattle. So it looks as though if you were attending a feast at the, at the Earls ha um, halls, they might be giving you material or giving you some some um, food away to take away or you or alternatively you could they could be getting tribute coming in it's sometimes difficult to distinguish between the two when you're looking at element representation um in terms of livestock husbandry um i looked at one of the sites that the, the earls of orkney had as their estate and it would seem that they're actually um rearing livestock there this is the, this is also drawing on the work of some of my phd students from from when i was a, a lecturer in bradford um vicky ewans jeff davison and jacqueline towers um so it, it looks like you've got this um livestock husbandry system geared towards the production of food that is then being consumed on the earl's estates um apart from in the apart from pigs which may be um redistributed a little and could be some evidence for, for tribute. Um, so we've got um, using a combination of this different types of evidence, um, taking a holistic um, approach to, to this question, um, you can see that the um, Earl's estates were producing meat themselves for their commensal obligation. You've got high status um, indicators, the pigs were being consumed preferentially by um, the Earls. Um, and so you also get a change in the nature of commensality through time. It seems that as you move towards the later Norse periods, um, as the Earls are becoming more kingly in their in their outlook, um, almost in some ways um, aping um, medieval kings, um, they they become their diet becomes much more 
um, restricted in the sense that only they can then they can consume the sort of indicator of status, i.e. I pigs. Um, so this is a very quick snapshot. I'm sorry it's quite rushed, but it gives you a quick snapshot of the kind of um, information that you can pull together to get a much more holistic approach of um, consumption in the past. Um, and also the kind of um, how you can then use that information to say something about how societies may have changed and adapted. Um, before I go any further, I feel I should also bring in another major site that I'm dealing with, and this is the site of Ness of Brodger. Um, I'm taking you way back into the Neolithic now. Um, the Neolithic um, is, well, the dates of the Ness of Brodger are given there, about 3000 to 2500 BC. Neolithic is the time of the first farmers um, in Orkney when farming first arrived and, and was, was developed. Um, mine ha uh, sorry, Ness of Brodger is, is a very significant site um, in terms of uh, it, the impact that it's having on our understanding of the Neolithic. Um, and I'm dealing with, um, I'm leading the research programme for the zoo archaeology. This is um, an ongoing research programme, so I'd, I'd, um, I'm only going to give you some sort of preliminary findings here. Um, and again, as I said, I'm going to focus primarily on what what this evidence can tell us about food um, and and consumption behaviour in, in the Neolithic. And again, um, in terms of leading the research, I've been working extensively with, with research students, um, postgraduates and, and our MLET students at, at Sheffield, uh, sorry, at, um, at the UHI. Um, so, um, in terms of um, deposition food and consumption at the nest, the most amazing thing about this site is a very large um, bone deposit, which encircles one of the structures, structure 10. Um, it's entirely comprised of cattle, um, and more than just that, it's entirely comprised of one element, the tibia, which is the lower shin bone. Um, there's around about 400 individuals represented, and I, I don't like giving um, estimates of meat consumption because it, it kind of depends on um, it depends on a lot of factors, including the size of the animal, um, the, the sort of husbandry of the animal. Um, we can assume, we can make some assumptions, and those many tibia would, would generate around about 3,000 kilograms of meat alone, and that's just the tibia, it's not the whole animal, obviously. Um, and the whole animal must have gone somewhere else. But at the Nessa Bro Brodger, this, this big assemblage of animal bone, um, it, um, it, it does talk to the fact that there must have been a large gathering of people. Um, we, can, we can assume some kind of feasting event happened. Um, and the, the fact that it is tibia that's represented tells us that um, the tibia is meaningful to, to the people of that time. Um, it's very difficult for us to understand what that meaning is um, at the moment. Um, some of the things I've been doing with this site is, is developing new um, recording methods for zoo archaeology, um, using GIS approaches and, and also using um, laser scanning um, to try and better understand how, how, um, how these kind of feast deposits are formed. So that's another sort of methodological area of development that I've been involved with. Um, so the story of the Ness will will um, remain to be told from for another day, but it 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 really is a, a truly amazing site, um, and I'm very pleased to be leading the zoo archaeology um, researcher at this at this site. Hey, um, in the time that I have left, um, I want to take us from the past into the present, um, and I want to sort of reflect on another area of research that, that I've developed um, during my time at the UHI, um, and that is um, using the archaeological evidence that, that we're recovering, and in, in my case, it's the archaeology of food, as a way of um, addressing some of the issues that we're facing today in terms of um, in terms of our modern society, in particular in terms of climate action and um, food security. And the work that um, I've, I'm doing here develops from two projects that I was involved in, um, one of which was a higher education academy um, grant to look into the embedding of sustainability concepts and ESD, education um, for sustainable development within um, higher education 
curriculum. And then following on from that, an NSF funded grant that I was involved in, which again, you know, had a similar aim. And this was working with Tom McGovern with NABO. Um, and that was to, you know, to sort of look at how we could put education for sustainability um, within um, embed it within the work we're doing as archaeologists and, and then look at um, climate action and, 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 and indeed use citizen science. So my interest here, and I'm kind of going to take you through a, a development here. Um, I started off by using food and um, diet in um, a couple of projects that were ongoing in the UHI um, led by Jane Dan. So this is my place, our heritage. Um, and also um, the Wild Being project. And here um, I was interested in how we could use the middens that we um, we recover um, with the animal bones within them to say things about um, coastal erosion, you know, where we've got middens eroding into the sea. And we have many of these in Orkney due to rising, um, rising sea levels. A lot of our archaeology is eroding out, as you can see in this image here, which includes midden remains that tells us about food in the past. So I was interested in how you might use that evidence um, by working with children and, and local groups. Um, and, uh, and then also the Wild of Being um, Festival, which allowed us to use a coastal erod erosion midden as a focus for discussion about um, shifting resource use, refuse disposal, consumerism and species extinction. So after being involved in, in these projects, I wanted to think of a way that we could develop these ideas a little further through um, you know, through the work that we're doing here. And so um, one of the ways of doing that was to, to actually embark on a, a, a sort of feed, a fieldwork project that had at its heart some of these issues, using middens as a, as a sort of way of um, raising awareness of climate change, but also um, working with the local community um, and, you know, working on middens and food histories by doing so. So the net sort of to the sort of eventual product of that was the was the excavation that um, I instigated at the UHI at sorry at Scale Farmstead in Rousey, and this has developed into a larger field project which is which I'm running together with Dan Lee, Sarah Jane Gibbon, and Jen Har Harland. Um, we started off with the midden and it's kind of gone from one midden, a post medieval clearance house midden that tells us about the 19th century in this island of Rousey, which is actually the island I'm from. So it's very, very lovely to be working back there. Um, and, you know, this site has has kind of keeps on given, giving because it takes us all the way back to to um, the Viking period. We have a hall. Um, underneath this lovely um, 19th century building, and we've got middens associated with that all the way up. So we have the potential to develop into a major field project here and, and we're seeking funding to, to do some of that. But what this site has also done is act as, as a platform for an, a series of other initiatives that again kind of speak to this idea of um, community archaeology, citizen science and using the past to, to inform the present, uh, present. And I'm going to give you some, some examples of that now. So um, one of the the platform or one of the things that this is allowing us to do is participate in um, a new initiative led by UNESCO, which is the, the UNESCO Bridges um, programme, which is part of the, the most initiative. Um, and I've led the UHI um, application um, to be one of the first UNESCO Bridges projects. Our project is Gateway to the Atlantic. It's a collaboration between the UHI, University of Bradford um, and City University of New York um, through the NABO and GIA initiatives. Um, Bridges Coalition is the first humanities led international sustainability science and issue within UNESCO. So it's a real privilege to be to be involved with this. Um, what we're hoping to do is use um, a series of case studies in Orkney, one of which is the Scale Farmstead, um, to um, look at a series of questions in terms of adaptability and resilience of small small island communities to local and global challenges. And these are things like significant climate shifts. Um, we've got a couple of those in the period that we're, we're looking at. Um, global pandemics. We've got the Black Death actually <laughs> occurs in this time period. Um, food security, which is where my interests particularly lie, 
impact of famine, impact of globalization of trade, impact of the commodification of trade when we start to have global markets developing in um, from the 17th century, sorry, 18th century onwards, um, and population impacts, emigration, impact of the Scottish clearances, and so on. So these are some of the themes that that the the our participation in this project will, will help us look at. Um, it's also underpinned by sustainability science and here um, the sort of key factors are community training, training of um, education for UK students and also international students and most importantly participatory place-based science, citizen science and, and climate change awareness. So this is the, the sort of things that we're, we're, we're aiming to do as part of the Bridges programme. Um, and these are the sites we're using. So Scale, um, Swandrow, which is the University of Bradford site, and um, Tombs of the North and Catasans, which is another UHI project. Um, what Scale has also allowed us to do is, um, is use the evidence from Scale to, to participate in um, the major international project that Andrew mentioned uh, at the beginning of the, of the talk. So this is the Lifty project, which is um, an AHRC DFG major research grant. Um, it's, it's a collaboration between the UHI, University of Vienna and the German Maritime Museum, as well as the University of Lincoln. Um, SCALE is one of the case studies. It's not the only case study, but it is one of the case studies that we're using. Um, and we have a various themes um, that, that we're, we're looking at. We're, as mentioned earlier, we're, we're looking at um, the beginning of um, globalization of trade. We're looking at the the role of the the German traders, the Hansa, in in developing these world system trades and and the impact that these have on the Northern Isles in particular, Shetland and Orkney. Um, where I'm what I'm particularly interested in with my interest in food and and diet and um, culinary traditions um, is the impact of um, new imports on on the sort of traditional diets of, of these islands. So, for example, over this time, we get the introduction of sugar, we get the introduction of spices. This, this will have had an impact both on the health of the people who lived in Orkney, but also on the culinary traditions. And, and that's the kind of area that I'm particularly interested in, in researching as part of this project. Um, I'm also interested in how this trade will have impacted on um, Farming system. So this takes you know takes me all the way back to the, to the beginning of my PhD, re, or the beginning of my research where I was a PhD researcher looking at livestock husbandry. So I'm very interested in, in sort of applying some of the techniques that um, I've developed over the years to understanding um, the impact of this trade on production within within Orkney and Shetland. Um, and then finally, this is a, a project that is that is in development, but it kind of comes out of these interests as well. And this is um, taking this interest in the diet of um, Scottish Highlands and how it develops and how it changes with trade and exchange um, during the, the post medieval period all the way up into the present and think about how that historical tradition of diet, which we can pick up through archaeological sources, but also historical sources, what that um, historical development of diet traditions might have what kind of impact that might have on, on human health. So, in other words, implications of our dietary history and our trading partners and the sort of new resources that we might have come in through the connections that we have with, with as part of this the developing globalised trade, what, what implications that might have for, for our health today. Um, and I, I have a collaboration underway with the UHI Centres for History and Rural Health um, we're, we're hoping to create an interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary research network for Scottish and medieval foodways. Um, we'd started um, on our path towards this pre-COVID. We were going to be running a um, workshop in Inverness, I think it was just a week before lockdown, um, with, the, with the lovely title as Sugar Killing Us. Um, and this was, you know, this is this was something that we had to shelve because of COVID, but it's something that we are still um, keen to develop. So I'm, I'm leading the development of this. Um, we've, we've kind of indicated it's the, the title, the taste of the nation, um, and um, we're hoping to to sort of develop it further in in the next in the next year or so. 
Um, so I'm conscious of the time. Um, I think this is now my last slide. Um, I hope that in the sort of rapid run through of um, Troch and Trencher exploring food fodder and tasting the past and present, um, I've given you some indication of, of you know, what science in archaeology is, um, what archaeological science can tell us about the archaeology of food, and what that can then tell us about past societies. And I've, I hope I've also given you some insight into the kind of research that I'm, I'm beginning to do and hoping to lead as my time as professor here um, in terms of how archaeology of food can um, start to address current issues and concerns, particularly in relation to climate action and health. So I will stop talking now um, and stop sharing and go over to um, go over to Jane, I think. Thank you, Ingrid. That was a really stunning talk. I hope you can hear me. I can hear you. I can hear you now, Jane. <laughs> um, I think it's um it's so fascinating to hear a roundup of your research in in this form, um, and to see all the contributions that you're making in so many different areas. Um, we just have uh, one question showing at the moment, which I will ask you. Um, and this is to do with the Nessa Brogger. So, you're being asked, is there any side selection evident in the cattle tibia from the Nessa Brogger? It's a really good question. And no, there isn't. It, there, there are left and rights. Um, there's no, there's no particular um, selection of side. And um, I mean, that's a really interesting question because on other feasting sites, um, I think it's, there's a, a really nice example in in Wales, um, which I think is is Iron Age, um, where you know there's only one part of the body, one half of the body was was um, deposited. Um, but at the Nessa Brodger, it would seem both lefts and rights are, are represented. So um, it's not there's not a selection at that level. Um, and of course, when I say 400 individuals, I did check that they weren't matched in case that's going to be the next question. I did check that they are, um, you know, they are, they are individuals as opposed to matching pairs. And I, in fact, I found very few matching pairs, um, which is also interesting, I have to say. So, in, in your lecture, you've given us this massive amazing scope through time uh, of different animals selected for feasting. Um, I was wondering, um, I think it was a Viking period, maybe the pig was the go-to feasting animal, perhaps in the Neolithic uh, cattle. So I wonder if you could just, you know, if you had to pull out an animal for various periods for their, their go-to show-off <laughs> feasting animal, which would it be? Yeah, I would I would hesitate to do that because I think it's context specific actually. So, in um, in Orkney in the Viking and Norse period, it's pigs. So pigs are the ones that are they're using. Um, they're not just eating pigs, but the 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 earls are are. If you find pigs, they tend to be on the high status sites, so they're using those in a way to show um, their power. Um, you know, it's it's a diet. It's like it's like us eating um, oysters or something like that. You know, they will eat other things, but pigs are the ones that they use. Um, if you look in Iceland, however, they are at the same time it's cattle that are being used in that way. Um, so there, you know, there is a context specific difference. And but then if you look in Scandinavia at the same time, pigs again were very important. And what I've argued in some of the papers that I kind of you know, gave you citations to <laughs> um, is that um, the North Isles and Orkney might be referencing their Scandinavian homelands when they're consuming pigs. Um, pigs are also associated with pagan feasting. So at a time when, you know, when the, the Norse were actually pagan rather than Christian, pigs would have been important. So it could also be that they're referencing um, a pagan style of consumption, which you know would be interesting if they're, if you know if that is the case, and they're doing that as Christian earls. Um, yeah, so context is is really important because you use context 
it, how you use a food really does vary on the context that you're consuming it within. Um, so it does mean different things to different people. And likewise, you could say the same about the Neolithic, um, because at the Ness of Brodger, it would appear to be cattle. And actually, you also have cattle turning up in um, the links of Notland, as, as a, which is another Neolithic site in Orkney, where you know, you've got this amazing cattle skull deposit underneath um, underneath a house. Um, you know, so it's it, again, they're using cattle in, in a particular way. Um, but if you go down to Darrington Walls, which is a contemporary site in um, in Wessex, it's pigs that seem to be the animal that are being consumed there. So it is it is context specific. A long way of explaining of answering that question. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. And I think for me, that's something that makes your work really distinctive is that attention to context, the social and the archaeological context. There are a couple of other questions. Um, sneaking in but i think they open up quite broad discussions there's one about why tibia and one about uh, the tomb of the eagles so again that's about i suppose a totemic or a particular aspect that i think you might you must have to address those to ingrid by by email maybe you'll take them um because i'm going to that. just make some closing words now okay okay so um well thank you very much ingrid that's just been so fascinating and I'm just going to speak a little bit about the professoriate and the role that you're being awarded. Um, being awarded the role of professor is the most privileged moment in the career of an academic, I think. Um, the title of professor is only given to highly accomplished and recognised academics. In fact, it's regarded in this country as being the highest rank in academia. So what do professors do? These mysterious boffins. Usually they have advanced degrees such as masters or doctorates, as Ingrid does. They'll often manage their subject areas, conduct advanced research, much of which will be published, as in the case of Ingrid, and they will supervise and mentor postgraduate students. They also act as ambassadors for their institutions, representing the university in the wider context often working pro bono for the communities in which they're based. And we've seen many examples of that from Ingrid's work. They are aspirational role models for progressing academics and peers at all levels. The University of the Highlands and Islands is just over 10 years old. However, we already have a professoriate in the region of 50 professors specialising in subjects including diabetes research, history, digital health, marine science and archaeology too. We can now add Ingrid to this list. My subject is archaeology and heritage, and I'm based in Kirkwall at Orkney College with Ingrid and with Professor Colin Richards. As it has be recently been pointed out to me by an eminent colleague, together we constitute 60% of the professoriate teaching Scottish archaeology in a Scottish university. And importantly, I think Ingrid and I are the only two women professors in this body. So I think it's um, a very significant day that, we, that we're celebrating today. My, my experience in this role has been one of extending networks and contributing to the growth of international profile of the UHI. And I'm sure that our new Professor of Archaeological Sciences will also have a hugely rewarding experience in her new role as Professor. Please join me in welcoming to the Professoriate of the University of the Highlands and Islands, Ingrid Mainland. <laughs> I can so, hear clapping. <laughs> so you can hear it from the other room. So yes, welcome Ingrid, and I'm sure I clap for everybody. <laughs> okay, well um that's just uh yeah, my closing remarks and now I'd like to just thank everybody very much for joining us all in this wonderful occasion and I'm sure you've all enjoyed Ingrid's lecture as much as I have. There is another one to come from another new professor on Monday, the 25th of October, which you can see on the screen in front of you. So I'll just now um, say good evening to you all and um, thank you very much for attending. And yes, keep up correspondence with Ingrid if you've got any more burning questions. Thank you.